Uh, hello to everybody, and thank you first for the organizers for um, inviting me to discuss this highly important topic, as we already heard from Dole this morning. Uh, I'm a pediatrician, and I'm a sports medicine specialist, and I thought that uh, that would uh, bring me to working with healthy persons, uh, but it ended up that I'm working with the world's most prevalent chronic disease. Um, that's how life takes you. Um, <clears throat> financial disclosure. Uh, it's very rare to receive money for giving talks on physical activity, so this is the amount in dollars and this is the amount in euros that I receive for these things. <clears throat> so let's begin. Um, we have three pictures of lovely young ladies, uh, A, B, and C, and uh, um, the girl at, in A is crying, the girl in B is, looks a little bit worried, and the lady in C is ex looks extremely happy. Can you guess which medical treatment here is exercise? Could you guess? C. Girl A is receiving her measles vaccination, which everybody should receive since we've been having this measles thingy around. Girl B looks worried because they're treating her cast. And of course, lady C is exercising. So it's not that bad. Um, and can you think of any other medical treatments that can be taken joyfully, <clears throat> are truly enjoyable once you find the one that you like, and are even taken voluntarily by healthy people as well? I mean, how about colonoscopy? Who likes that? Or how about that dentist appointment that you keep on postponing? Isn't this, doesn't, doesn't this look much, much better? And just to, uh, of note, <clears throat> six weeks ago was World Obesity Day, it was dedicated to bias and stigma. Uh, do you know how difficult it is to find a photo like this on Google? It is very, very difficult. Um, <clears throat> so we will not discuss, but we will acknowledge that exercise is medicine in both preventive medicine and in both treating numerous diseases. It is good for us. Uh, it has numerous clinically significant health benefits from fetus to centenarian, <clears throat> from head to toe, and in all sexes, ethnicities, modalities, chronic health conditions, including obesity. <clears throat> it both prevents, it, I mean, it doesn't prevent perfectly, but it has a um, significant role in preventing and treating Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, age-related macular degeneration in the eyes, heart disease, numerous types of cancer, uh, fatty liver, Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel diseases, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, <clears throat> I promise toe, gout. It decreases gout symptoms. Okay, so it, it, it does uh, only good. It is well proven scientifically and repeatedly for nearly eight decades in all study designs, observational, questionnaires, activity trackers, various, various types of method. And the physical act activity prescription for health has a sound and decades long stable scientific basis. It's not just one article in the New England Journal of Medicine, it, it is, uh, it is a matter of guidelines that have been uh, practically unchanged for these past decades. Um, and there's a lot more to come. We don't know everything. There's a lot of genetic and epigenetic interactions with physical activity or brought about by physical activity. There's the effects on the microbiome and numerous things that we will discover in, these, in the future. Uh, an important thing which also relates to the uh, psychologists that spoke before me, <clears throat> it should be tailored individually according to personal preferences and some technical limitations. If you have a disease or you, if you do or do not have a park nearby your house, um, if you do or not have enough money to go to these expensive classes, and it has to be tailored just like any other medicine that we uh, administer or treatment. So obesity treatment essentials. <clears throat> um, exceedingly fat children, we don't say fat anymore, but it's an older text a bit, will usually be found to be hearty eaters and of inactive habits. Obesity is rarely a serious condition and ordinarily requires little more than certain restrictions in diet and regularity in exercise. Generally, this is not difficult to obtain as the patients are usually very anxious to reduce the weight because of the attention they attract and the remarks the condition occasions in public places and among school fellows. So it's rarely a serious condition, requires just a little bit, restriction in diet and regular exercise, and what draws them to treatment is the bias and stigma. Isn't that perfectly true today? This is from one of the first pediatric textbooks from 1920. We've known this for over 100 years now. 
over 100 years. We know how to treat it. Uh, and we know we also had the prescription during the warmer months, golf, swimming, tennis, horseback exercise, and the bicycle are advised. A definite time in hours being prescribed each day for some active physical exercise. A definite time in hours. This is the prescription. Um, <clears throat> later on, entered modern scientific research. In the 1960s, we started <clears throat> uh, addressing body composition, dividing the body to different types of tissue. And this is an, a very important concept when we're, when we're discussing physical activity. Um, <clears throat> you all know that when we lose weight, we lose weight. We lose both fat mass and fat-free mass. And in general, the more weight that you lose, the more fat-free mass you lose, either by diet or either by um, um, bariatric procedures. You lose weight, you lose your fat-free mass in general. Why is that extremely important? Because we have a relationship, as you are, I'm sure know, between the amount of fat-free mass and our resting metabolic rate, which constitutes, mo constitutes most of our energy expenditure throughout the day. Um, so if you lose weight and you lose your fat-free mass, you also lose, you move on this line and you lose your, a little bit of your resting metabolic rate. However, it's not just that, as of course you also know, we also have <clears throat> the metabolic adaptation. This line is from the relationship between fat-free mass and resting metabolic rate before weight loss, and these, uh, is this, this is the relationship after weight loss. So we have this metabolic conservation, the energy gap that we all discussed previously, um, and it is a very, very important thing when we're discussing physical activity and weight loss, and I'll show you in a second. Uh, the, the most worrying thing in these uh, talks is that you never know if the speakers before or after you will, will show the same slides or will, or will they say the same things or will they say the opposite. So I'm very glad that uh, my mind thinks like the great mind of Dole and we, always, we also look to the uh, studies on the biggest loser which is in, of course an extreme case. These are, is, uh, these are 14 people that have a six year follow up of drastic weight loss and we have that reduction in resting metabolic rate, which averages about 600 calories per day. And we have the metabolic adaptation, which averages about 500 calories per day. If these people do not compensate for that, 500 calories per day will amount uh, 22 kilos per year. So if you disregard that and just continue with your own life, you will gain that much weight. However, it may also equal about 60 minutes of walking at moderate intensity. So if you want to somehow balance that, you need to exercise. Um, we'll get to the huge variation of the metabolic rate decrease and the and metabolic adaptation a bit later on. But take a note that there's a huge, huge individual uh, variability. Now, we've known this metabolic adaptation thing for years. Uh, the original study, I'm not sure if this was actually the first, but it's surely one of the uh, best studies by Leibel and Hirsch in 1984 already that had uh, observational data on patients that lost weight. Later on, they had the Paramount study in the New England Journal of Medicine. And again, you can see that this is the line of the relationship between fat-free mass and resting energy expenditure before weight loss. And these black dots are after weight loss. Um, <clears throat> so we have more lessons from The Biggest Losers. Um, this is the study, the second paper that described the physical activity, which also Dole showed. Um, <clears throat> you can see that the persons that, lost, that were weight loss maintainers did not differ from the weight loss, or the, those that had less weight loss in their diet, but in their physical activity. There was a point missing in this paper, which I wrote, Dr. Holland just received the answer yesterday. What was the difference in the metabolic adaptation between these two groups? And actually, they were the same. They both had about minus 500 calories per day metabolic adaptation. So these successful weight losers were doing that by being physically active. If you look at uh, as a continuous uh, variable, this is the delta energy intake between baseline and the weight change. So this is diet. So no relationship between dietary changes and weight regain after six years, but there is a significant correlation between physical activity and weight regain. The more you exercise, the less weight you regain. 
And if you look at these guys who do not exercise, then this is their weight regain. So you have to exercise. Um, <clears throat> now these are just 14 people, again, an extreme case, and we have many lessons to learn from many more smaller losers. They're not losers, they're winners, but weight losers. This is a systematic review just published uh, not too long ago in obesity reviews, uh, <clears throat> looking at the determinants of weight loss maintenance. And in bold are the, are the things, are the items that do account for weight loss maintenance. Obviously, you have your energy intake on the left, your energy expenditure on the right, and the energy balance. So uh, there are uh, behaviors that affect energy intake. We'll hear about that later on in the next lecture. And there is, of course, the part of energy expenditure. Increased physical activity is a well-known and scientifically proven method of, uh, of uh, weight loss maintenance. So how much? Okay, so we understand that physical activity is important for both health and weight loss and minimizing weight regain. How much? This question was addressed over 15 years ago in the first stock conference by the International Association for the Study of Obesity, now the World Obesity Federation. Um, and they gathered world leaders in this field, and they summarized that in order to prevent the transition to obesity among persons who do not have obesity now, we all need to accumulate between 45 to 60 minutes per day of moderate intensity physical activity. Those 150 minutes per day that we, per week that we should accumulate for general health, they're fine, they're important, but they're not enough to prevent this weight regain that we all experienced throughout the decades. But in order to prevent weight regain, uh, we need between 60 to 90 minutes per day of moderate intensity physical activity. 60 to 90 minutes per day. And again, our, that metabolic adaptation is, uh, is probably the reason why we need to accumulate so much activity. This was later reaffirmed in the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines by the United States Department of Health. Uh, looking at the numbers, they calculated that, yes, in order to uh, uh, prevent or to achieve weight maintenance following substantial weight loss, we need to accumulate between 54, about 54 minutes per day at a four mile per hour pace, which is pretty fast, or 80 minutes per day at a three mile per hour pace, which is four and a half kilometers per hour which is brisk walking, uh, or jogging nearly 30 minutes per day in order to maintain your, uh, your newly reduced weight. This was also reaffirmed in the 2009 American College of Sports Medicine position stand on weight loss and prevention of weight regain, saying that <clears throat> enhanced prevention, prevention of weight regain with those of physical activity that approximate 250 to 300 minutes per week, about 2,000 calories per week energy expenditure. This was also reaffirmed in the 2013 guidelines on the management of overweight and obesity in adults by the American Heart Association and the Obesity Society. Again, showing that the component of increased physical activity should contain higher levels of activity, approximately 200 to 300 minutes per week, to maintain lost weight or to minimize weight re regain on the long term. Uh, and it's also reaffirmed in real life, looking at the success, successful weight losers, we reviewed the characteristics of this, of the, of this cohort. 94% uh, <clears throat> of them increased physical activity, most frequently walking. 90% reported that they were walking an average one hour per day. So it's not only the metabolic calculations, this is also what happens in real life. <clears throat> uh, if you look at how, how much uh, energy is expended through physical activity, in this uh, cohort, you can see that about a third are expending over 3,000 calories per week, which is over 430 calories per day in physical activity in order to maintain and become a successful weight loser. Uh, um, these persons are expending over 285 calories per day, which is over 2,000 calories per week. But then you also have this quarter that are expending very, very few calories. I suspect these are the persons with the lower energy gap. They do not have to compensate for minus 500 calories per day. They only have to compensate for like 100, minus 200, 300, 100. Okay, so this is where they lie. We don't have enough studies on that yet. Um, <clears throat> and uh, 
I, as I started saying, the explanation to this and a caveat, which you can see in numerous publications, that we're continuously using, using the means, the means, the means. And also, as some of uh, uh, lectures showed individual data, it's very, very important. This is a study on metabolic, uh, resting metabolic rate, resting metabolic rate changes in 20 females. After weight loss, about half increased their RMR about half decreased their RMR. On average, you can say, hey, there was no change. <laughs> half of them decreased RMR. These will have to work very hard to maintain their weight loss through expending this amount of physical activity, or in this amount of calories in physical activity. So the solution to this would be individually tailoring the diet and exercise uh, frequent monitoring of weight, and if your weight starts to regain, well, you have to maybe add more exercise, more intensity, more frequency. Uh, you can repeat the resting energy expenditure me measurements. It's just 20 minutes of lying down. So that's it. Maybe there's a financial side to it. You have to pay for the test. But in 20 minutes, you can receive a number and see how much did that decrease, uh, and then tailor the energy expenditure and your energy intake. Um, so, fantastic. You know, the, uh, we have about an 18 minute attention span. So every 18 minutes you should do something else. We're not gonna stand up and start hopping around, don't worry. Uh, intermediate summary uh, regarding what I just said. The probable mechanism for weight regain emerges from that aspect of energy balance and the energy gap. Reduced obesity mandates some compensation for the resting energy expenditure reduction by that fat free mass loss and the metabolic adaptation. And as I said, there is a huge individual variation between minus 200 to minus 800 calories per day. 800 calories per day, that's like a spinning class every day that you have to perform in order to offset that and compensate for that. It's, it's, it's nearly impossible to maintain uh, lost weight with, with that kind of energy gap. Uh, so based on metabolic, metabolic calculations and real-life data from the National Weight Control Registry, on average, on average, between 4 to 5 to 60 minutes per day of moderate intensity physical activity is needed, such as walking, swimming, cycling, aerobics, ball games, you know, wh whatever you like, whatever the patient likes. That's what's needed to minimize weight gain. Oh, and of course, Controlled eating and self-restraint will also help in that, and we'll, we'll hear about that in the next lecture, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> just one slide on bariatric surgery, because we have an, a, a talk on that as well. The same principles apply. Um, uh, this is a study from Dr. Busetto's group, just also recently published, showing that there is a decrease in resting energy expenditure following the sleeve gastrectomy, as opposed to what we see with the Roux and Y. So maybe these are different mechanisms regarding the setting of the of our, our, our hypothalamic set point of body mass. Um, both observational and interventional studies showing that exercise can assist in weight loss reduction following bariatric surgery. And <clears throat> it is emerging as an effective therapeutic strategy following bariatric surgery. Uh, as I said, I'm a pediatrician. Uh, I deal with mo mostly with adolescents that have undergone bari bariatric surgery. I tell them, the operation will reduce half of your excess weight. You and I will reduce the other half. And at the end, this is what they look like a year after surgery. A year after surgery, okay? And these, have, these were 120, 140, 150 kilos adolescents. Of course, they underwent bariatric surgery. Uh, and we actually did a study and looking at what, what behavioral, what, what, um, uh, what can predict the large amount of not only weight, but fat mass loss. And only two things emerged as predictors. One was being male, and the other, ones, the other one was physical activity. And we also showed that uh, looking at a, as, as a continuum, the more exercise they performed, the more weight and fat mass did they lose. <clears throat> Just an example of what happens if you do or do not exercise following bariatric surgery. I had two 18-year-olds they both weighed about the same and had the, about the same weight reduction one year after surgery. One was completely sedentary, one was exercising, and if we look at the relative proportions of fat mass and fat-free mass lost following uh, the operation, the sedentary guy, of his uh, 60 kilos, about a third were uh, muscle mass or fat-free mass, as we frequently see. 
but the exercise the guy from all his 60 kilos, only 9% were muscle mass that were lost. So, okay, so they say, okay, you've convinced me. Exercise is good, even after bariatric, bariatric surgery. What should I do? Should I do aerobics? Should I do resistance training? Should I do, be doing both? Tell me what to do. Um, <clears throat> so obviously the answer to that would be, what do you like to do? But we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but I, we do need some, some database on what should he be doing. Um, <clears throat> there have been numerous studies similar to this one. Just pick, I just picked this one. 120 sedentary adults with overweight or obesity were randomized to one of eight-month protocols. Either res resistance training, just with the normal type, three days per week, three sets uh, every time, uh, eight to 12 repetitions per set, just your normal resistance training um, protocol. Uh, these were doing aerobic training, okay? Uh, uh, this is like, this is uh, moderate, moderate to vigorous intensity. And the third group did both. They did both the aerobic aspect and the resistance training. And if you look at, uh, uh, if we look at the results, another huge important thing to remember. Don't look at weight only. And this is another fault that we have in numerous studies looking at weight change. Okay, so this is uh, uh, eight months after. This group gained one kilo. So did we fail? Did, did they fail? If, on average, if we, look, if we took these and these together, like, you know, we lost maybe a half a kilo on average. These did not fail. What is that new kilo that they gained? That was muscle mass, of course. Okay, so don't just look at weight. They did not decrease their fat mass. The aerobic training group decreased their fat mass and did not build muscle but the aerobic training and resistance training reduced their fat mass and built muscle. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at waist circumference change, the aerobic group were here and the combined group were here. They lost more in their weight circumferences. And if you look at fat percent change, this is the resistance group, aerobic group, and the combined group had the largest decrease in their body fat percent. But what the author stated at the end was, <clears throat> The resistance training, the combined group took twice as much time than the just aerobic group. So they said if we're balancing time commitments against the health benefits, it appears that the aerobic training alone is the optimal mode of exercise for reducing fat mass and total body mass. So that's what I tell the patients. Aerobics is preferred, but if you can find the time to add resistance training, that would even be much better. Oh, we said time constraints. We have exercise in cappuccino cups now. Not really, but it's called high-intensity interval training. Hit H-I-I-T, high-intensity interval training. High-intensity, up, and then rest, <laughs> and then you know, rest for a minute or two, doing something else. Then, then doing your high-intensity thing, <laughs> then doing your high-intensity thing again, and then resting. Um, uh, there's even a systematic review, meta-analysis, comparing these high-intensity interval training with normal, moderate-intensity, continuous training that we do in uh, affecting body composition in adults with overweight and obesity. And this is the difference. They both reduced, um, they both reduced body weight by about, I think, three kilos, something, three kilograms about. Uh, there was no difference between them in the effect on uh, body weight or uh, kilograms of fat mass loss, the body composition changes. The huge difference was the time that it took. The hit on average took 95 minutes per week and the normal moderate intensity thing took 60% more than that, 160 minutes per week. So you can achieve exercise, you can achieve that espresso type exercise and get similar effectiveness across all body composition me measures and in a time efficient manner that we are, we're all so overworked, maybe this is an option for some patients. So <clears throat> some practical recommendations. At the end, the patient is sitting in front of you and he says, you know, what, sh what should I be doing? <clears throat> so what comes to mind is first walking. You, you ask them, what would you like? What do you prefer? Adults mostly prefer walking. With children and adolescents, it's a lot easier. We have numerous option, the options. The younger the kid, the more options we have. Ball games, classes, uh, 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 dance classes, aerobics, uh, various types of exercise. And as they go older, 
you don't have those ball games anymore when they get, become adolescents. Then they usually, again, like adults, just go to the gym. Uh, <clears throat> but walking, walking in a park, using numerous types of behavioral uh, modification strategies like activity monitors, even your, your own pedometer inside the phone, uh, various apps that can track you and remind you. We have online programs, peer support, online peer support programs. Adopting a dog has been found in trials to increase walking by people. Um, <clears throat> uh, in, uh, more per in persons with larger amounts of obesity, you would want maybe lower impact and lower loading activities, such as water-based activities. You can, if you walk in the water up to your waist height, it reduces 50% of your body weight. So it can ease, if you have any knee, knee pains or ankle pain from osteoarthritis, it can ease the pain. And you all know what it's like walking in front of a wall of water. If you're walking in the water up to your chest height, you've reduced 80% of your body weight. And remember how difficult it is walking in water. So that is an option that can be taken up. Cycling, which does not load on your knees and, and ankles as much. <clears throat> you can walk on a treadmill. Sometimes they have these shock absorbers, which can be easier, again, on the joints, as opposed to walking outside. There is an anti-gravity treadmill that hooks up to you, and, lift, hooks up to you and, and lifts you a little bit, so you reduce, again, the weight on your joints. You can use that cross-trainer thing that also does the same. You can choose low-impact exercise classes. You don't have to go to that crazy Zumba girl on Wednesdays at, at 8 p.m. <laughs> <She's, laughs> you might die, but you can find you know, l lower intensity in exercise classes and use those, but at the end, I tell the patient, you know, these are just a few options. You tell me whatever works for you. What do you like? What do you prefer? Okay? You find your sport, and then you find your greatness. And after we've found the sport, they have to keep coming to clinic to receive counseling and strategies to assist in, in long-term adherence. And we want to target those maybe 300 minutes per week, you know, 45, 60 minutes per day. If the patients come frequently enough, we can get to that point. If they just came in once and heard this, then they go out of the clinic and say, well, I didn't hear anything new. He told me I should be do walking. I knew that. Yes, but are you doing that? Okay, so here, here comes the psychological aspect and the behavior modification and the strategy and the, uh, and the um, motivational interviewing of how to make them actually perform that and get that so important medical treatment. Um, so I thank you very much. At the end, we have to, the lectures are nice, but we have to go outside and actually do these things and get our patients more active. And if we, we are all active, it would uh, transfer to the patients as well. Thank you.